Amen. You may be seated. They can get you on a little bit of fire your wood's wet. All right. And so, uh, I just praising God down there that the Spirit moving. And if you didn't feel the Spirit moving, I want you to be praying that the Spirit will move in your life. All right. Um, I'm just going to give a little bit of witness here. The title of the sermon is The Struggle is Real, and we're going to talk about that. There's no doubt about it. Even Paul, the one that wrote almost a half of the New Testament, struggled at times with sin. Matter of fact, he had a thorn in the flesh. He asked God to remove three times. And God said, my grace is sufficient. We still don't know what that is. Some people said it was a wife. I don't know. Uh, some people said that it was his eyesight. I don't know. I have no clue what it was. It doesn't matter what it is. What matters is, is that God's grace is sufficient. You see, sometimes we forget that. And we're, as we talk about the struggle being real today, before we get into past, we're getting to what Paul was telling the Romans was, is very simple, that we are dead to the law. Okay, that means when you and I receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our lives, then all sin was forgiven. We're dead to the law, and we're alive in Christ, dead to this whole world, and alive in Him. The problem is we still live in these old stinking bodies. We live in this old stinking world. And we live around people that are not right with God and don't even know God. Create some issues. And I'm just gonna, gonna say this. I don't I don't I don't brag on on Corey a lot. Corey's like a little brother. I like smacking his chops for him, you know? And uh, and, 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 Co and Corey can tell you that. There, I get honest and serious sometimes with him. Uh, but he's like he's like a little brother to me. And uh, I've known Corey about 20-some years now. And you know the reason I love Corey is because Corey loves the Lord. I mean, I'll guarantee you, if I'm going to ask somebody to pray for me, Corey's one of the ones I'm going to ask to pray for me. You know why? Because I know he won't do one of those mimbly, flimbly, lay me down to sleep prayers at night. He'll get honest and on his knees to, with God and pray. And so, see, I'd rather have somebody that knows God and knows the spirit of God and wants to live for God more than somebody that thinks they know everything, does everything, and thinks they're perfect in everything. I, I want to tell you, I know God's priming our church for something. I don't know what it is, but I know he is. I'm old enough, a lot of you youngsters, just hang with me. I remember priming the well at my grandma's house. Some of you don't know what that is. Remember, sis, had they had this little pump, hand pump, in the kitchen, there was one outside too. There was one time there was one in the kitchen. The one outside was a tough one. You see, you took a little boat off and you had to pour a little bit of water. So if you used all the water, you didn't have anything to prime with. The problem is today in many of our lives, we're dry. We don't even have anything to prime with. But see, what you had to do is it only took sometimes a cup or two or maybe a quart at the most. You would pour in there, put that cap on real quick, and you'd pump like crazy until the water started coming out. And when that water started gushing out, man, that water was cold, fresh from the ground. That was before they put sewers right over the wells. You know, I mean, that was a day when water was fresh coming out of the ground. And, well, you would pump that thing and pump that thing, and you could fill buckets all day as long as your arms didn't run out. I want to tell you what we need is the Spirit of God to be refreshed in us. And we need to sometimes pour a little bit of water in there. Let the Spirit move. Pump like crazy till you feel the hand of God in your life and overflowing with Him. 
Is that struggle real? Sure it is. All of us have different struggles. I want to tell you, your struggle is not my struggle, and my struggle is not your struggle, but I guarantee you this, I've got struggles. And my wife's not going to tell you what they are. And I'm not going to tell you what hers are. I know some of you don't believe she has any. Some of you don't believe my sister has any either. I'm not going to snitch on either one of them. But we all have struggles. So we're going to be in Romans, the seventh chapter, and we're going to start with verse 7. Powerful, powerful word of God. And some people misuse this verses, and I'll mention that before we're done. In verse 7 of the seventh chapter, it says, Well then, am I suggesting that the law of God is sinful? Of course not. In fact, it was the law that showed me my sin. I would have never have known that coveting is wrong and the law had not said. You must not covet. Here's Paul admitting to one. This isn't his only one. This is the one he's willing to admit to. You know it's like you telling friends, well, I had this sin this week. I thought bad about somebody. You've been thinking bad about people all your life, and you're finally going to tell somebody because you want them to know who you thought bad about so you can tell them why you thought bad about them. He said, boy, you know, coveting. Man, I wouldn't have knew it was sin unless God's word said not to covet. You see, one of the things I want you to do today, and it's not totally correct, but I believe it's correct enough, is any time the word law is here, mentioned here, I want you to think about the word of God. Because you see, at that time they only had the law, and at that time when Jesus came, he fulfilled the law. So now all of God's word fulfills the law, and so when we talk about it, I believe you can put the word of God in there and be okay. So, as we go on to verse 8, it says, But sin uses this command to arouse all kinds of covetous desires within me. He said, sin gets to me at times. Now, why would Paul want anything for heaven's sakes? Paul only spent half of his ministry in jail because of the gospel. Paul didn't have a place to call his own. Paul slept in other people's houses all the time or slept out in the ground all the time. Paul didn't have anything that a lot of people had. Paul, matter of fact, lived on what people gave him most of the time and worked his way through life working to be able to support what he did in the gospel. My goodness, why would he covet anybody's stuff? You know, I mean, when you don't have anything, you probably want a little of something sometime. The problem with us today is we have a lot of stuff and we still want more. Corey mentioned, but what we need is more of Jesus. What we need is more of him. What we need is more of what God can do within us. In verse 9 it says, at one time I lived without understanding the law, but when I learned the command not to covet, for instance, he's saying for this one instance, I'm just using this as an example, he said, the power of sin came to life. And I died. Now he's talking about dying to sin. When you and I received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, he forgave us of our sins, cleanses us from all unrighteousness, he lives within us, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells within our hearts, we are dead to trespasses and sin, although because we live in a human body, we still have a sinful nature that likes to stick its old ugly head out sometimes. And I know some of you right now think, oh, I'm, I don't really have that problem. I hope you don't light up in front of everybody. Liar, liar, pants on fire. You know, I mean, it, it's one of them things. We all have some problems. You say, well, I don't have any big problems. Hey, sin is sin. You talk bad about people? You got a temper? You argue? You complain? You negative? Woo! That's just hitting a few. He said, and I died, and so I discovered that the law's commands, which were supposed to bring life, brought spiritual death instead. It goes on in verse 11, says, Sin took advantage of those commands, and deceived me have you ever been deceived by satan 
I don't usually ask people to do this. But everybody in here that knows Jesus Christ that is saved. Have you ever sinned since you've been saved? Would you just raise your hand? That's, oh, come on. Some of you are lying right now. <laughs> all right. So pretty much everybody in here raised their hand. We've all sinned at one time or another, haven't we? All right. He said, man, matter of fact, Satan's here to deceive us. You see, that struggle is real. And there's certain sins in our life that are more real than other sins, and they get to us easier than other sins. See, I may not have a problem with things that somebody else has a problem with. It doesn't mean I don't have sin. And the problems that I have, I can see in other people faster than anything else. You know why? I know what they are. I've been doing this a long time. I've watched people all my life. I've studied people all my life, all my adult life and ministry. I want to tell you something. It has happened many, many times. It ones that stand up and criticize other people, the things they criticize other people about is a sin that usually they're dealing with. You know why? They know it so well that they can see it from afar off. Well, we've all got problems. Satan's deceived us. He used the commands to kill me. But still, the law itself is holy, and its commands are holy and right and good. But how can that be? Did a law which is good cause my death? Or, Of course not. Sin used what was good to bring about my condemnation to death. So we can see how terrible sin really is. He uses God's good commands for its own evil purposes. There is no way we could ever go through all the sins that are on people's lives. But unfortunately, Satan twists everything that God's word has to say. Satan will tell you that you're better than other Christians. You know more than other Christians. You go to more church more than other Christians. You talk about things more than other Christians. Satan will tell you you're better than everybody else. I want to tell you there's nobody in here better than anybody else. We all were sinners that were doomed to hell without Jesus Christ dying on the cross of Mount Calvary for our sins. Praise God. You don't have to be quite so quiet. So the trouble is not with the law, but it, is with, but it is spiritual and good. The trouble is with me. Paul's saying that the trouble's not with God. The trouble's not with the things of God. The trouble is with me. And then he says, for I am all too human, a slave to sin. I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. Have you ever set out and you're thinking, man, I'm not, I'm not ever going to fall into that. Matter of fact, I know that that's a generational sin in my family, and you'll never catch me doing that. Baloney. Matter of fact, you don't have to raise your hand, but how many of you thought when you were kids growing up, I will never Talk that way to my children when I get older. I have heard their voices come out of my mouth. It's amazing to me. There's sin in my life that said, Lord, I don't want to ever do that again. Please, Lord, please, Lord, take it from me. I don't ever want to do that again in my life. But yet somehow down the road, my eyes start looking, my mind starts thinking, my heart goes away from God, and I start sinning against God in my life. Oh, I want to tell you, Paul said, man, there's a struggle. There's a fight. I don't want to do it, but I do it all the time. I don't want to do it, but somehow my mouth opens and words come out. 
I don't want to do it, but I say things that I know I shouldn't say. And then what we do, Satan justifies it. Yeah, but if you wouldn't say it, they wouldn't get right. They don't need you to get right. They need Jesus Christ. Verse 16 says, But if I know, listen to this, But if I know that what I am doing is wrong, this shows that I agree that the law is good. Let me tell you something. God tells us that he will convict us. If you're not being convicted in your life, you may not know my Jesus. You see, there's, there's a problem here. If your life is not being convicted about something that's wrong in your life, you may not know Jesus because Jesus will convict us of sin in our life. His Holy Spirit that dwells within us, that's his job. Verse 17 says, So I am not the one doing wrong. It's the sin living in me that does it. Now, some people misuse this verse. They said, oh, okay, everybody sins. How many times have you heard that? Everybody sins. Sheesh. Is it true? Yes, it is true. Is it a true statement? Yes, it is true. But it's not one we should live our lives by. Well, we ought to live our lives by, I am free in D. As we sing today, God set me free. I don't have to do it anymore. I don't want to do it anymore. And by the grace of God, I won't do it anymore. Because I have been set free. Verse 18 says, And I know that nothing good lives in me. Woo! Some of you think your stuff doesn't stink. Well, let me tell you it does. That is in my sinful nature, he says. See, my sinful nature has nothing good. My godly nature has everything good because it's like him. I want to do what is right, but I can't. He's struggling. Here's Paul. I say it again, he was in prison half of his life for serving the Lord, beat almost to death. He was out in an ocean, shipwrecked. He went through stuff you and I would never go through in our lives. Why? Because he loved the Lord so much and he's saying, listen, there's nothing good in this old sinful nature. The only thing that's good is what Jesus has done for me. I want to do what's right, but I can't. He said, there's times I really try. I try hard. I don't think he was thinking about the serious stuff. Let me tell you why. Everybody would have wrote about it. I think he's talking about stuff. Maybe even that was mine, his mindset. I think he was probably talking about stuff like how he felt about people that mistreated him, that he had a hard time maybe even forgiving. I don't know. But I guarantee you, if it was a big sin and he was in adultery, they would have wrote about it and it would have still been around. And that's without Fox News or CNN or any of the others. Verse 19 says, I want to do what is good, but I don't. I don't want to do what's wrong, but I do it anyway. Verse 20 says, but if I do what I don't want to do, I am not really the one doing wrong. It is the sin living in me that does it. Now, he's not giving you an excuse here. He's saying it's that doggone sinful nature. It's that doggone sinful nature that keeps coming out on me, and I don't want to do it, and I do it. I don't want to have it. I want to be spiritual. I want to be who God created me to be in him. I want God to be more than anything else. I want to stop this junk. I have discovered this principle of life that when I want to do what is right, I inevitably do what is wrong. I love God's love, law, with all my heart. I love God's law. I love God's word with all my heart. You see, Paul wasn't making excuses here. Well, Paul says, I love God's word. And I'm going to stay in God's word. So I don't become what the sinful nature wants me to become. I become what the spiritual nature says I am. You see, that's the difference today. That's the difference in you and I. 
that you and I have Jesus in our heart. The Holy Spirit lives within us, dwells within us, and that Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. Again, if you are not being convicted of sin when there's sin in your life, maybe you don't know my Jesus and you need to come to know him today. Man, I want to tell you, not only will he convict you of sin, he'll get you on your knees before God and you'll have to ask God to forgive of your sin. There's not enough preachers today preaching that sin even exists. Folks, I want to tell you, the Bible covers it over and over and Jesus died on the cross for your sin. You don't think God wants to get you out of your sin? You don't want to think God doesn't want you to ever return? You don't think God wants to see you set free indeed? Verse 23 says, But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable person I am. This is Paul. This is Paul. We would all love to be more like Paul. You know, Paul's getting honest here. Paul's getting real here. He said, I'm a miserable human being. Matter of fact, he said, I'm the worst of the sinners. Who will free me from this life that has dominated my sin and death? Listen to this. Thank God. The answer is in Jesus Christ our Lord. So you see how it is. In my mind, I really want to obey God's law. But because of my sinful nature, I am a slave to sin. I want to tell you, you and I are slaves to sin, but you and I don't have to let sin in. I, you know, we all say, well, nobody's perfect. I get so sick and tired. It's obvious that nobody's perfect. I can talk to you for three minutes and realize that. That's for sure it. But it is not an excuse not to be who God created us to be in him. Because of the blood of Jesus Christ, you and I can live our lives for him. You know that sin that haunts us all? Praise God, he forgives it. Takes it away. You know that sin we keep falling back in? Every time we ask God to forgive us, he lifts us up and draws us to him. See, the problem is you and I like sin a little too much. We get to the point in our life where we say, oh, I know it's sin, but it's not that bad. Matter of fact, sometimes we say, I know it's sin, but it's not as sinful as other people, and we name somebody else. Let me tell you, you better name Jesus Christ, because he's the one we're to compare ourselves to. And he lived without sin. You say, oh, nobody was perfect. Let me tell you this. God said Job was perfect. Didn't mean he didn't sin. It meant he knew what to do with sin. He said David was a man after his own heart, and David had a lot of sin. But he knew what to do when sin came into his life. He gave it over to God. You see, that's the difference. That's what makes us who we are in Christ, is when we know to give that sin over to God, it's tearing up our lives. You've heard me say before, I don't understand how people get drunk and put their heads wherever people, other people have put their rear ends. It doesn't make sense. But they do it. Why? Because they get a little bit of a lift and they forget about this world. You want to forget about this old world. What you start doing is giving your life totally over to Jesus Christ and let God take you through this world with a whole other set of eyes. You see, that's what it's all about. You see, you and I don't see straight. You and I need our hearing and eyes fixed. We need to be able to only hear the things of God, see the things of God, live the things of God, apply the law, apply the word of God to our lives that we might be set free and set free indeed. Is it a struggle? Yes. Paul says, man, I'm, geez, I'm a miserable person. Let me just tell you, we're all miserable people. Saved by grace. God forgives us of our sin. 
You may be here today and you may not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You say, I don't even know what that means. Well, let me tell you this. Jesus came through a virgin birth, lived a sinless life, never committed sin, died on the cross of Mount Calvary that you and I might be saved. And all we have to do is to know that we have sinned. Ask God to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Come into our heart and dwell on the throne of our lives. You see, that's what it's all about. Now, some of us did that many, many years ago, but sometimes we forget who's sitting on the throne in our lives. And we want it our way instead of his way. We want to do things the way we think they ought to be done instead of the way he thinks they ought to be done. We want to see it the way we've always seen it. We want to be able to take the word of God and apply it, but somehow we just don't do it. Matter of fact, maybe one of those things that makes us so miserable, we promise God that we're going to spend more time in God's word. And somehow it hadn't happened. Maybe then we're going to spend a little more time in prayer. And somehow it just hadn't happened. Maybe we're going to spend a little time in God's house going to church. And somehow, something just seems to always get in the way. Maybe the list goes on and on. But I want to tell you, you and I can take care of that today. If we'll just give it over to God. And leave it in God's hands. And quit taking it back. If you don't know my Jesus today, you can come and invite him in your heart. I would love to pray with you to do that. We have others who would love to pray with you to do that. Maybe today, and we had some that said they're going to come at the end of service to be anointed with oil because they have some physical and medical problems. And James, it says that if you have problems like that, you need to come and ask the elders of the church to anoint you with oil. Maybe today you just need to come to pray. Maybe you need to come to rededicate that life. Maybe today you need to just come and spend some quality time with God. I'm going to ask you all to do something that I usually don't ask you to do. I, I'm not one of them guys that ask you to repeat after me. I'm not one of them guys that ask everybody to stand, everybody raise their hand, everybody sit down. I, I think the Spirit of God gets to do that. But I just want you to everyone to bow their heads right now. Nobody looking around. If you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I just want you to pray. You've heard me say this prayer many times. I want you to just repeat after me, and you don't have to do it out loud. Just repeat after me. Mean it from your heart. Father, make me who you created me to be in you. Father, I want to worship and serve you like never before. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Now, if you're here today and you've never received Jesus in your heart, I want you just simply to say this prayer. Heavenly Father, forgive my sin. Come into my heart and save me. Thank you for saving me today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you said that for the first time, would you come today when we have the invitation in just a moment? I'm going to ask everybody to stand. I'm going to lead us in prayer. Then I'm going to ask you as Corey comes and sings that you'll just come today and do whatever God's asking you to do. If you need to be anointed with oil, sit right here if you would, facing that way. We're going to get some of the elders in the church to come down. Maybe you need to pray for family and friends. Maybe there's some spiritual things going on nobody else knows about, and they don't have to. God knows about it already. Would you give that over to God today and say, Lord, I'm giving this to you finally, once and for all. I don't want it back. I told somebody to do this just the other day, and I tell everybody to do this. I do it all the time. Satan comes to me at something, and I said, I gave that over to God. Satan, take a hike, take it up with God. And I go on singing praises to the Lord. You say, you really talk that way? That's exactly the same words I used. You know, I'm no respecter of the devil. I'm a great respecter of God. Whatever you need to do today, after we pray, would you just step out and come? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word today. Father, we, it's a struggle in this life, and we know it. 
Father, we all have different sins, and we like to pick out other people's sins, but, Father, I pray right now you'd hone in on our hearts. Father, that we would do whatever you ask us to do, that we would obey your spirit promptly and come today. Father, I want to praise you for who you are. I want to thank you for this church, Lord, and what you want to do in our midst. Father, I want to thank you for what you're going to do. Father, I'm looking forward to seeing you work in our midst. Father, I pray right now, I know already Satan's trying to rob the victory out of people's hearts. Father, I pray your Holy Spirit would hone in one more time. Bring us to you, O Lord, today. And these things we ask in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen.